Lecture 6, Is the Brain a Digital Computer? I think the most exciting thing that has happened in the study of the mind in the past two decades is the advent of the new discipline of cognitive science. Cognitive science uh, forms a union of uh, psychologists, philosophers, linguists, computer scientists, neurobiologists, and anthropologists to form a new discipline for studying the mind. And it's a tremendous advance over the behaviorism that dogged American psychology for really a generation or more. The, the secret of the advance that cognitive science makes over earlier modes of studying the mind is that it's willing to go inside the black box and try and figure out what's going on. Old-time behaviorism, as I mentioned in earlier lectures, was concerned with trying to find a correlation between the input stimuli and the output behavior and was unable to try to account for the processes in between. Now cognitive science is interested in what goes on inside. That's the good news. But the bad news is that cognitive science in its inception was obsessed with the idea that what's going on inside is a computer program and that all we needed to do to study cognition was to design programs that could pass the Turing test and then find out from our psychologists whether or not the actual programs that human beings were following were like the programs, were the same as the programs that we were designing in our artificial intelligence laboratories. Now, I have argued in previous lectures that the idea that all there is to having a mind is implementing the computer program is mistaken. And you might think, well, that's the end of it. Then we can forget about it and do the thing that traditional cognitive science was reluctant to do, and that is study how the brain actually works. Study the brain on its own terms. Take brains seriously. However, I have to say that the whole story about the computational model of the mind has another chapter and this lecture is going to be concerned with that other chapter. To get into that we need to distinguish not two questions but three. The first question is is the mind a computer program? We've seen the answer to that is no and we now know why. It, the program by itself can't be sufficient. The second question is, well, can we use computers to simulate cognitive process so that it helps us in our research? We can design experiments. We can test various hypotheses on the computer. I have done this myself in my work in the philosophy of language. There, it seems to me, the answer is clearly yes. The computer is a very useful tool. And as you know, the answers to those two questions are distinguish strong AI from weak AI. The answer to, is to strong AI is no. The answer to weak AI is yes. But there is a third question that looks like the first question but isn't really. And that's that question we must now address. That question is this. Is the brain a digital computer? Now, you might think, well, that's really the same as is the mind a program, but it's not quite the same. There are a lot of people who will accept the Chinese room argument. They'll say, yes, okay, there is a distinction between the syntax of the program and the semantic content of the mind. But it doesn't matter for cognitive science. Why? Because we can study the brain as a digital computer and grant that mental states and processes carry more than a computational component. We'll give Searle his semantics. Tell him, yes, you can have all his touchy-feely, airy-fairy thoughts and feelings going on, but what really matters to hard-nosed cognitive scientists is the fact that all of those semantic contents are attached to a syntactic structure. And the actual mental processes by which the brain works are computational processes operating over the syntactic structure of processes going on in the brain. So the idea is this. Every time you have a thought, I mean, you do a kind of logic textbook inference. You think, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Now, that, that's the kind of stuff you do in elementary logic courses. Okay, now, when you had those thoughts, you actually had a semantic content. You were thinking about Socrates and men and mortality. But there were sentences, and those sentences had a syntactical structure, and the basic 
mental processes operated over the syntactical structure of the sentence. So what mattered for the actual causal account of how the brain works was not the semantic content. The semantic content went all along for a free ride. The actual work, the actual processes went on at the level of the syntax. Now, I've tried to explain that in a clear way, and I think maybe it doesn't sound very clear, and I think, frankly, that the theory isn't very clear, but I'm doing my best to try to make it clear. And the idea, the basic idea is this. There are a whole lot of sentences in the head. We would normally think of them as sentences in English, but in fact, the real scientific account of the sentences in the head would probably be that they're, they're at a much more basic level. Uh, they're in some m more fundamental language of thought, as Jerry Fodor calls it. He's one of the authors of this idea. And we can think of the mental processes that go on when we're engaged in any cognitive activity, when we're seeing something or understanding sentences or engaged in a conversation. We can think of those as processes operating over the computational structure of sentences in the language of thought, and that's immune to the Chinese room argument. That is, we can grant there's a distinction between syntax and semantics, and we can grant that minds have semantics, just doesn't matter. What really matters is the structure of the syntax and the computational processes operating over the syntactical structure of mental states. So it could turn out, and in fact we think it's true if we accept this, that the brain is a digital computer even though there's more to having a mind than just having a computer program because the extra stuff, the semantics, goes along for a free ride. And in fact, this is the next step in the argument, we now have some terrific results in mathematical logic that make it seem clear that we need a distinction between a theory of how logic works for syntax, that's called proof theory, and how it works for the semantics, that's called model theory or semantic theory. And in fact, we can do just about everything we want to do in logic at the level of the syntax. So instead of saying, I, Socrates is a man and all men are mortal and so on, we just have a lot of symbols that represent that. We just have uh, P, P, arrow, Q, and we have a rule that says whenever you got P and P, arrow, Q, you write down Q, and that's the law of modus ponens. Now notice what we did. We stripped away the semantics and we just had a lot of syntactical objects, and those syntactical objects are what's doing the work. Now, I want to try to make this sound appealing because a lot of people believe this, and it looks like we've now got a way to carry on cognitive science as a computational study. We've now got a way to interpret the theory that the brain is a digital computer, and the essential thing about mental processes is that they are computational processes, even if we concede that there's more going on. It's just that what more goes on is epiphenomenal. It's just froth on the wave. The real guts of a science of the mind will be a computational theory about how the syntactical structure of mental states is operated on by programs in the brain that work on the syntactical structure of our mental states to produce cognitive processes. As I said, I don't think that's all that clear, but it's the best I can do to try to make it sound clear, and later on we'll, we'll see that there is a deep unclarity at the base. There's a deep unclarity which we're now going to have to try to sort out. Okay. Now, just to have a label, I call that intermediate view cognitivism. So we got strong AI, all there is to the mind is a program. That's wrong. We got weak AI, uh, program, programs and computers are useful. That's right. But we got this intermediate position which says, yes, strong AI is wrong because it's more than having the program, but all the same, the brain is a digital computer. The answer to the question, is the brain a digital computer, is emphatically yes, and we can study mental processes as computational processes. Now, when I first saw that, I thought, well, if we're going to argue that the brain is a digital computer, we better know what we mean by computer. We better go back and figure out exactly what fact about the brain would make it into a computer and what fact about its processes would make them into computational processes.
And when I read the literature on this, I found an interesting lacuna. We don't really have an agreed on definition of what is a computer, what is computation, what is a symbol, what are computational processes. Now, my university makes tenure decisions on the assumption that we know uh, the answers to those questions, but there is no satisfactory theory that ties the mathematics to the electronics. See, we're in a peculiar kind of situation. We have gorgeous mathematics. I told you about some of it uh, in earlier lectures. We have, um, uh, 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 we have Church's thesis and Turing's theorem. We've got recursive function theory, and we've got proof theory and model theory, which I mentioned today. We've got this mathematics, and of course we've got this marvelous electronics. We've got all these wonderful machines that we buy in stores. So we just assume somebody must have done the hard work uh, the hard philosophical work of connecting the mathematics to the electronics. How does the ma how do the mathematics and the electronics get together? But the fact is they haven't. The fact is that's what we're going to have to try to do today. We're going to have to try to figure out the answers to some of those questions. See, let me put this to you in in terms of my own experience. I read some books about. Um, com theory of computation, books on uh, uh, computability and computable functions. These are logic textbooks. And then you read uh, some books about uh, computers, how computers uh, actually work, about the actual physics, and, and about, in particular, then you read books about brains, how brains actually work. And then you find these cognitive science who tell you what the mathematics books were describing and what the brain books were describing was really the same thing. They don't sound like the same thing. I mean, it just doesn't look like it. When you read about neurons, it just does not look like anything you found in your uh, recursive function theory, in your theory of computation. It doesn't smell right to me to say what those poor brain stabbers were really trying to tell us was about the mathematical structure of the brain. At this, that doesn't smell right to me, and at the beginning of investigation, I follow my sense of smell. So maybe it turns out it's a false alarm, I'm going the wrong direction, but let's see where it takes us. If we're going to examine, then, the question, is the brain a digital computer? We better know what is a computer. Well, I don't know any place better to go to find the answer to that. Then back to Alan Turing. He, after all, invented these notions. And you remember I told you in our earlier lecture that according to Turing, what a Turing machine does is these four operations. I, it prints a zero and erases a one, uh, prints a one and erases a zero, moves one square to the left, moves one square to the right, and it does those according to a program of the form if C, then A. That is, all the instructions are under condition C, perform act A. But now then, we open up the skull and we look. What are we supposed to look for? I mean, I'm a very literal sort of guy. And if I read that my uh, computer is manipulating zeros and ones uh, with a tape, my natural inclination is to want to take the thing apart and find that damn zeros and ones, right? I mean, what am I paying my money for? But my friends who do this professionally tell me, Oh, no, you won't find any zeros and ones, and you won't find a tape. Well, why not? Well, they say it doesn't actually matter that there are real zeros and ones, but you do something that's functionally equivalent to zeros and ones, maybe different voltage levels. Maybe you got four millivolts is zero and seven millivolts is one, and you got a computer that goes very rapidly through what are called state transitions, where it goes from one state to another state, and it does these according to the program. And that's really the equivalent of the zeros and the ones. But then you begin to worry about that, and you think, well, now, what fact about the electricity makes it into symbols. What fact about the electricity, what electrical fact makes these things into zeros and ones? And then you begin to read more of the literature, as I did, and you find, well, look, you don't even have to have electricity. The beauty of computation is any mechanism will do, provided it's got a, a, enough state transitions to carry the computations, provided it's stable enough and rich enough. And I mentioned in an earlier lecture that these guys report with enthusiasm 
that all kinds of things can be computers. My favorite is Ned Block's claim, you can build a computer using cats and mice and cheese. And you have the, the, the gate opens and the mouse runs out to the cheese and the cat jumps on the mouse and one of those is zero and the other is a one. And if you had a, a big enough set of cats and mice and cheese, you can do what any computer does. It's computationally equivalent. Now let's think about that a minute. Here is some guy who tells me the brain is a digital computer and, but don't worry about the, uh, the structure of the neurons because you can do it with anything and not even just silicon chips, but you can do what the brain does with cats and mice and cheese. You just got to have a whole lot of them, like maybe millions or billions of them. That they, these people report this with enthusiasm that you can do what the brain does in all these other media. You can do it in water pipes or pigeons pecking. That's another example in the literature from, uh, I think that one's due to xenon pollution. But I, and, they, and as I said, they, they report this result with enthusiasm. It's a wonderful discovery that the physics of the brain don't, doesn't matter. All that matters is the computational structure, and you can have computationally equivalent systems in any medium, whatever. Beer cans banging against each other, anything you like, provided only that it's rich enough and stable enough. Now, that ought to worry us. If I got a result that said I could do anything my brain does with billions of beer cans banging against each other, I mean, two beer, can, uh, two beer cans banging for every neuron firing, I guess, or, or with uh, cats and mice and cheese, uh, I would be worried about that. But all of these examples are taken from the actual literature on the subject. I mean, there are, people have actually said these things. But now we want to ask what I think is the crucial question. What fact about a system makes its operation computational? What fact about a system makes its operation into symbol manipulations? What fact about some entity makes it a symbol? And let's recall our distinction between those features of the world that exist independently of us that are observer independent and those features of the world that are intrinsic, that the observer dependent on the one hand, and, and, uh, the, the features of the world that are observer dependent and those features that are observer independent or intrinsic. So we saw that the natural sciences typically deal with intrinsic or observer independent features of the world, such as force, mass, gravitational attraction, mitosis, and meiosis, for example. But in addition, there are lots of features of the world that are perfectly objective features of the world, but they are observer relative or observer dependent. In my house, for example, there are a lot of books. Now, what fact about the physics makes them into books? Well, it, being a book is not the name of a physical feature. It's the name of a function that something can perform. It performs that function in virtue of its physical features. It's got these marks written on these pieces of paper. But that all, the fact that all that adds up to a book is not a fact of physics, but it's observer dependent or observer relative. It's the fact that we have designed, organized, produced, and used these things as book that makes it into a book. Okay, now if we take that distinction, if you give me that distinction between those features of the world that are intrinsic or observer independent and those features of the world that are observer relative uh, or observer dependent, then the crucial question is, what about computation? Is computation observer relative or is it observer independent? Is it an intrinsic feature of nature? And it seems to me the answer is obvious. If we go back to Turing, the zeros and ones and all of that, it has to be that computation is observer relative. It's dependent on us. We can assign a computational interpretation to a process if the process has certain structural features, but you don't discover computation going on process.
Now this has a disastrous a digital computer. Some compute and some set a contract only relative to the assignment of a computational interpretation. You can't discover computations going on in nature anymore uh, uh, than you can dis discover uh, uh, books uh, uh, growing in nature. What you discover is artifacts which human beings have designed and used for certain purposes. Now, the beauty of computation is that you can assign a computational interpretation to natural processes and thus do a computational simulation of those processes. But you don't discover computation going on in nature. So let's take the question we began with. The question was, is the brain a coherent action? Because it's brainly digital. The answer is nothing is intrinsically a digital computer. Something's a digital computer relative to somebody's interpretation, relative to the use we put it to, relative to the assignment of, of a computational interpretation of the phenomenon. So the answer, is the brain intrinsically a digital computer, is trivially no, of course not. But then the next question is, well, can you assign a computational interpretation to the brain? The answer to that is trivially yes, you can assign a computational interpretation to anything. I mean, look, door open equals zero, door closed equals one. That's a very simple computer. You can't do much with it because you can't uh, do the, uh, the zeros and ones very fast and so on. But, the, but you'd... Anything whatever can be assigned a computational interpretation. As I mentioned in an earlier lecture, you can assign, take a, an object and simply assign a zero. Let this be zero and let zero be interpreted as stay there. It's just a boring digital computer. So the upshot is that in a way, cognitivism is worse than strong AI. Strong AI was at least false. But cognitivism is incoherent. It's ill-defined because if the thesis is that, uh, if the question is, is the brain a digital computer intrinsically, the answer to that is obviously no, nothing's intrinsically a computer. And if the question is, well, can you assign an interpretation, the question is vacuously, yes, you can assign a, computation, a computational interpretation to anything. All right, now if you look at the extensive literature on computational theories of the mind, you wonder, how do the authors deal with this problem? How do they deal with the fact that it looks like, in order to have computation, you've got to have someone making a computational interpretation of the phenomenon in question? And it's interesting how they deal with it. Uh, of course, they don't face the problem explicitly, but there are various rhetorical devices by which we cope with the fact that computation only exists relative to interpretation. And the standard device in cognitive science involves what is technically known as the homunculus fallacy. Now, you all know what the homunculus means. The homunculus just means little man. And the homunculus fallacy is the fallacy of supposing that our cognitive processes can be explained by postulating that there's a little person, a little man or woman in the head who is doing the cognition for us. Uh, my favorite example of the homunculus fallacy is the theory of vision that says, well, the way that vision works is you take in these uh, input uh, stimuli in the form of light waves and you process them, and then there's a television set. There's a little television set at the back of the skull, and there's a little homunculus in there watching the television. And I have this is uh, the, my favorite version of the homunculus fallacy. Uh, the light waves come into the eye; they're processed through the this box here, that's the lateral geniculate nucleus. It's a big deal uh, in vision. And then finally, in, back here in the visual cortex, you have the TV set, and here's the little man watching television. Now, if you get the homunculus fallacy as a result, you are in very deep trouble, right? Because if we're trying to explain how this guy sees, it's no explanation to say, well, it's because this guy sees, because then you're going to have to have another little homunculus inside his head, and they're going to get very soon too small for me to draw on the blackboard, because they're going to be an infinite number of them. Okay, the homunculus fallacy, then, is a catastrophic 
result. However, it's no longer frightening to cognitive scientists of the computationalist variety because they think they've got an answer to it. And the answer goes as follows. It's true that we talk homunculus talk. And it's true that when we describe cognitive processes, we have to use a homuncular vocabulary. I'll give you some examples of this in a second. But the idea is, don't worry about it, because we're going to get rid of the homunculi by replacing smart homunculi with stupid homunculi. And the idea is, eventually, you will get homunculi who are so stupid that all they say is yes, no, zero, one, flip, flop. And that's, then you got rid of them. You discharge your smart homunculi with stupid homunculi so you don't have to worry about the homunculus fallacy. Now, when I first read that, I couldn't figure out what these guys were talking about. Smart homunculi and stupid homunculi, I don't want any homunculi in here at all. Well, the idea is not such a, a dumb idea. The idea is this. The aim of cognitive science is, at least in part, to show how complicated mental processes can be reduced to simple processes. And, in fact, that's part of the appeal of the computational model of the mind, is that we know in, in computation how to reduce complex processes to a binary operation on symbols, to zeros and ones. So if we can do that with computation, then what we need to do to get rid of the homunculus is to show how complex homunculi, intelligent homunculi, are replaced by stupid homunculi. Now let me give you an example of how this is supposed to work. Uh, I have a pocket calculator that multiplies 6 times 8 to get 48. Uh, how does it do it? Well, let's postulate a homunculus. Uh, there's a homunculus in there that multiplies 6 times 8 to get 48. But now how does that homunculus do it? Well, he's replaced by stupider homunculi. Uh, what, the, what actually happens is that the calculator adds 6 to itself 7 times. That is, it takes 6 and makes 7 additions. By the way, they always say it adds 6 to itself 8 times. That's bad arithmetic. That gives you 54, right? I mean, the fact that these guys can't get their arithmetic right <laughs> worries me. But anyway, uh, you start with, with 6 and then you do 7 operations on it and you get uh, 48. And that's, so you've got the smart homunculus is now replaced by a stupid homunculus. And then you ask, well, how does it do the addition? How does it uh, add uh, six to itself seven times? Well, then you see there are even dumber homunculi. You see, the smart one said, I, I multiply six times eight. The dumber one said, I just do addition. Now they're real dumb homunculi. They say, we don't know from addition and we don't know from multiplication, but we know how to co convert bi uh, how to convert decimal symbols into binary symbols. So we take all these symbols and we convert them into a whole lot of decimal. Uh, I, we convert the decimal symbols into zeros and ones. And then finally down at the bottom are a whole lot of really stupid homunculi. And they say, we don't know from decimal and binary, and we don't know from addition, and we don't know from multiplication, but we just do flip-flop, yes, no, zero, one. And they're the army of stupid homunculi. And the idea is this. The smart homunculi didn't really exist. That was just a manner of speaking. All that really exists is the stupidest homunculi. Now, this has a fancy name. This is called recursive decomposition. And the idea is that the homunculus fallacy that threatens to dog the footsteps of the cognitive scientist, because we're constantly talking homunculus talk, the homunculus fallacy is removed by replacing intelligent homunculi with progressively stupider homunculi until finally you have a homunculi that just do binary operations. Yes, no, zero, one, flip, flop. Now, does that solve our puzzle? You see, here was our problem. Our problem was there's no physical fact about brain operations that makes them into computational operations. Such any physical fact we find would only be computational relative to some interpretation. So we need a homunculus in the system who adds a computational interpretation. 
Now, does it avoid the homunculus fallacy to say, well, we can replace smart homunculi with stupid homunculi? And it seems to me the answer is no, it doesn't. We're right back where we were. That is, the homunculus fallacy gets us out of the frying pan into the fire because the difficulty is that our problem was not how do you reduce complex intellectual phenomena to simple phenomena, but rather what fact about the phenomena, whether comp is an answer to the question, is it a computational? And that's not answered by, the, by recursive decomposition because the stupid homunculi still have to be homunculi. They have to be making an observer relative attribution of computational processes, whether they're simple or complex. To put this in words of one syllable, you can discover circles and lines in nature, but you can't discover zeros and ones in nature because zeros and ones only exist relative to somebody who thinks that's a symbol. It's only a symbol if somebody assigns it or uses it or designs it as a symbol. Now, I've been talking in the abstract. Let me give you some actual examples of the sort of thing I'm worried about. Uh, a classic book on vision was written by David Marr. A Marr, it's a book is simply called Vision, and it gives a computational theory of vision. Now, Marr says, I believe it's on page one, that the task of a theory of vision is to show how the brain takes a two-dimensional visual array and by a series of computational processes converts it into a three-dimensional description of the world. You have a two-dimensional array on the retina and you produce a three-dimensional description of the world and that's what comes out at the end is a three-dimensional description of the world. Well, wait a minute when you read that. Who's reading the description? See, when I look at something, I don't see a description. I just see a person. I see a woman or a man. I don't see a description. All this talk about a description, that's straight homunculus talk. That would say, my knowledge that there is a man there or a woman there has to come from the fact that there's a homunculus in the back of my skull uh, reading off some description. And that's not what happens. Now, as I said, these guys think that's not really a problem because they've got their the two magic notions, the notion of multiple realizability, the same computation can be realized in different mechanisms, and recursive decomposition, you don't have to worry about the homunculus fallacy because we're going to dispose of the homunculus by replacing smart homunculi with stupid homunculi. That seems to me both of those fail as answers to our question. What we're interested in is the specific causal powers of the brain by which it produces actual visual experiences. We do not get rid of, of the specificity of of the processing in the brain by which actual visual experiences are produced by saying, well, really, the only thing that's doing any work are computational processes over symbols which are eventually because we have been got straight out. We don't limit ourselves. It leaves us less alone. Hey, where does that leave us then? The, the attempt to rescue computational the brain by needing stitch syntax and mix that that move uh, fails because the syntax is not intrinsic to the physics, to the biology, to the chemistry of the brain. Now, this argument is a deep argument, and it's deeper than the Chinese room. The Chinese room is kind of a very simple argument, and you understand it the first time you hear it. But this one's a little bit different, because what the Chinese room argument showed was that semantics is not intrinsic to syntax. But what this argument shows is that syntax is not intrinsic to physics. And that's much worse for computational theories of the mind because the computational theory of the mind wants to say cognitive science is a natural science. It's like chemistry and not like literary criticism. Literary criticism has to take human artifacts in the form of human texts and try and offer inter an interpretation. No literary critic thinks that he's doing physics.
But the idea of cognitive science is that it's supposed to be discovering intrinsic features of nature, and the difficulty is very simple. There's no way that you can discover that the brain is intrinsically performing computational operations because computation only exists relative to some interpreter. All right, now having said all that, let me add a qualification immediately. And it's going to be that this qualification, I think, strengthens the point. Of course, if a human being is actually performing a computation, I'm actually adding one plus one to get two, for example, then that's something that's intrinsically going on in me. It doesn't matter what people outside me say. I mean, if somebody says, well, I don't think he's really adding one plus one to get two, it doesn't matter, or I'm adding two plus two to get four. Now, the, except for these few cases of a human being actually going through a computation consciously actually trying to do some solve some arithmetic problem for example those are intrinsic but now the whole reason we design computers is so we don't have to do that so uh, we don't have to do all the calculation I, I, I sit at the control all day he's now got but that the fact that there are a subclass of computations that are intrinsic sees rest between the intrinsic computations for a thing and the observed relevant computation performed by an artifact that the beast are having in fast place. And it's point really that people think if your face is a vertif, well, that's a way of the But that's true. It's just an object in my pocket. It's a knife. It's a only relative to someone's using it as a knife, but you can't use anything as a knife. There have to be physical features that enable you to use it as a knife. And similarly, we spend a lot of money designing artifacts, uh, computers, that we can use to compute with. The important thing to see is that computation doesn't name an intrinsic feature of the process. The actual process, intrinsically, is elect electrical uh, impulses in an electrical circuit. Physically, the system is a very complex electrical circuit. Intrinsically, it goes through a series of electrical processes. The computation, like the words in a book, is relative to our use, design, program, and interpretation. Well, there's one last desperate move that the cognitivist typically makes when I present them with this argument, and that is, look, what we're really talking about is information processing. And when we talk about the computers and computation, well, the only interest that they have for us is that they, the computer is doing information processing, and that's what the brain does. The brain does information processing. We can describe it computationally, and the computer does information processing for precisely the reason that's what we designed these machines to do, is to do information processing. So all of these points about the observer relativity of computation fall by the wayside because we now see that the crucial element in computation that mattered to us was information processing. But again, I have to say, I don't think that answer is adequate, and we now, I mean, I think we have the tools to see exactly why. Is it observer independent, or is it relative to conscious agents who assign a, an information processing interpretation to the phenomena? And once again, the answer seems to me obvious. There are intrinsic cases of information processing. I try to figure out how to get uh, to Dulles Airport outside Washington, D.C. Now, that's a case where I am actually processing some information. But if I have a computer which is on my lap, which prints out uh, the best route to get to Dulles Airport, the computer knows nothing about Dulles Airport or about information. These are a bunch of symbols that the computer has, and I attach an information processing interpretation to them. So the information processing move seems to me to be no advance whatever because it simply repeats the same mistake. Now, you'd be surprised how pervasive this mistake is in our intellectual culture. The mistake is one of confusing those features of reality which are intrinsic, which are 
totally independent of us from those which are dependent on us. And we, the, the upshot is that we couldn't discover that the brain is a digital computer because something is a di digital computer only relative to our interpretation, use, understanding. And that is a more, an example of a much more general phenomenon that for functions in general, the function of being a knife or serving as money or uh, being a chair or a bathtub, we need to distinguish the intrinsic physical features of the system that enable it to function as a knife or money or a bathtub from the actual functioning, which is always relative to some conscious agents. So my conclusion is that we didn't rescue the computational theory of the mind by moving from strong AI to cognitivism, by saying, oh, well, let's give them semantics and just say what we're interested in is the syntactical processes. No, we, we, made an, we showed the depth of the mistake that we had been making all along. We were confusing the intrinsic features of the human system with the observer relative features of the, the computational system. And with that, I'm going to conclude the discussion of computers, and our next topic will be more related to how the mind actually functions.